I haven't been to India since 1993, but my favorite Indian city is Varanasi, Banaras, um, Benares, I guess. It's the equivalent, I guess, of Rome or Mecca for Hindus, or one of the many Romes or Meccas. Um, one of the reasons I like it so much is that it's the closest thing one can get, I think, on this planet to a trip back three or four hundred years in time. Um, it's where a lot of people go to get cremated and have their ashes scattered on the Ganges, or if they can't afford it, the body is just submerged whole into the Ganges. Um, I don't know if it's like this anymore. I haven't been there for a while, but um, one thing that uh, one notices when you study the, that that particular city is that there's the two most important people religiously in the city are the Maharaja of Varanasi, um, sort of the king, I guess, although in the Republic of India, nobody has any titles anymore, but religiously he's still venerated, the Maharaja of Varanasi. And a fellow by the name of the Dom Raja, or his title is the Dom Raja. The Doms are the people who work the cremation grounds, deal in um, cremation, uh, disposing of human remains. Um, they, you see them clustered around the cremation grounds, making sure that um, you know, people are properly cremated. And they get paid for it, of course. And the Dom Raja is the head of these people. They're called the Doms. Now, <clears throat> in the general scheme of things in the Indian caste system, um, having work that has to do with corpses is about as low as you can get on the, <laughs> on the social scale. Um, the Doms are untouchables, Harijans, Dalits, um, outcasts, whatever you want to call them. But they are absolutely essential to the world that is Varanasi, the phenomenon that is Varanasi, because you go there to be cremated, you go there to die and to be cremated, and the domes see to that. They see to your cremation and they see to the disposal of your um, ashes if you so desire, or they'll hand them to your son, your son will then spread your ashes on the Ganges, whatever. The Dom Raja is the head of these people. I've never actually seen either the Maharaja or the Dom Raja, but the Dom Raja uh, from a while back uh, was a fellow with a big mane of curly hair, black hair. He looked a little bit like Sai Baba, if you've ever seen him, Sai Baba of Puttaparthi. And he liked his cigarettes. <laughs> so in a sense, he's a low caste Hindu, and he smokes cigarettes, and he is the head of the guy who, or head of the organization that disposes of corpses. And if it wasn't for the domes, Varanasi wouldn't be what it is. So there's this strange dichotomy between the upper caste um, Maharaja and the Dom Raja. Who is more important? One almost gets the impression that the Dom Raja is more important than the Maharaja because the Dom Raja actually sees to the nuts and bolts of the disposal of human remains, which is what Varanasi's purpose really is. That's probably where it started out, as people were... Um, it became so holy that people wanted to be cremated there. So, in a spiritual sense, in a strange sense, the Dom Raja... Uh, untouchable though he is, um, technically filthy though he is, is absolutely essential for the um, for the identity of Varanasi, and it's he's not sneered at the way that, or at least the work that he does is though uh, the work that he oversees may be technically repulsive, but if he didn't do it, then something would be missing in the cosmos. Um, so in the grand scheme of things, does it really make a difference in terms of the world that we live in, whether or not you're the lowest of the low or the highest of the high? Who knows? We don't know. We do know that even the lowest of the low perform a function that is absolutely essential to society, every bit as essential as the people at the very top. Um, <clears throat> that's sort of the antidote to the arrogance that I referred to in the previous video. Uh, you think that, okay, I'm, let's say you're looking at this from the point of view of the Maharaja. I'm, I'm royalty. I'm a king. I can trace my you know, lineage back 2,000 years, whatever, whereas this guy's just a low-life untouchable. But uh, he does something which is indispensable, and he's just as irreplaceable at the end of the day as I am. And he may be just as spiritually advanced. We simply don't know. Um... And that's it, isn't it? How do you know how whether or not somebody else is outside of the matrix? How do you know whether or not somebody else has a, a good vantage point from which to gauge reality or 
whether or not your point of view is better than theirs. As I say, you step outside of the matrix the way, say, Morpheus and Neo do, or in you know Plato's cave, you take a, one of the prisoners out of the cave and he learns all these interesting things about reality. But does it do him any good? Does it do us any good to actually get that God's eye point of view, that vantage point? Um, not necessarily, and we don't really have any way of knowing. Um, how do we know how somebody else sees reality and how accurate it is? How immersed this person is in the great illusion, Maya, whatever you want to call it. How do we know? We don't know. There's the scene where in, in the Matrix where Neo and Morpheus are talking about the Matrix and there's all these people walking by and they don't seem to understand that these two guys are talking about them essentially. But it's entirely possible that the people that are walking past them in the Matrix are aware that they're talking about it, but simply don't feel the need to delve into this and try and understand what's going on. They may already know. They may actually know more than Morpheus does, uh, but they simply they simply lack the desire to talk about it to anybody else. They're simply living their own knowledge. So maybe those people are drones that are passing him in the streets, but maybe they're not. We don't know, and we have no way of knowing. Uh, India has an interesting story, which kind of goes to the um, the heart of the matter. Uh, it's called the uh, Vyada Gita. Uh, it's also in the uh, Mahabharata, like the Bhagavad Gita is. And it's this very advanced young mendicant, young sadhu, uh, renunciant yogi, who has gotten so far advanced in his um, in his austerities and in his yogic practices that he can burn animals to ash with his gaze. And he runs into a butcher um, who, you know, is looking after his aged parents and is serving, is killing animals and cutting up the meat and selling it to people, which in the Hindu uh, view of things is only slightly above being a dom in Varanasi dealing with corpses, because you're dealing with animal corpses, equally foul. And the young uh, mendicant is a Brahmin who will have nothing to do with, uh, with uh, flesh or anything like that. But... The aged, um, the aged woman who he meets, uh, who is, I believe, the mother of the butcher, is highly advanced and is able to read the young yogi's mind, and he's kind of blown away by this. Um, far more advanced spiritually, but even though she's just an, you know, just <laughs> an elderly woman um, in a family of butchers. And, of course, the young yogi is very chastened by this, and he learns the, the virtue of humility, which is not so much a virtue in terms of, you know, the Christian view of virtue, but it's actually something that is useful to him, because his arrogance had been a block to his progress as a human being, or as a mendicant, or as a, as a sadhu, or whatever, as a yogi. And he learned uh, from the old woman that anybody you see could be infinitely more advanced than you are, in, or in, in the case of, say, what I was talking about before, understanding what society or the world or, uni or the universe is, anyone else could be infinitely more um, wise than you are, and you don't have any way of knowing one way or another what level of accuracy this person has in terms of their view of reality. We don't know. And, you know, there's all these endless stories of how people get their comeuppance when they uh, fall prey to that arrogance and that elitism. Um, you know, there's the, the story, there's the line even in the Gita which says that if you offer Krishna a little bowl of water that you've taken, you know, just out of a public water source and offer it to him with the right spirit, he will treat that better than a, you know, a massive sacrifice by a rich man attended by a hundred priests. Um, and that says that as well. It says the same thing. Maybe maybe what the domes are doing is more is more useful or more spiritual or whatever. Um, getting to understand death in the way that they do by handling corpses and cremating them and always being involved in funerals and everything. You get a very good uh, idea as to the transitory nature of this reality. That might actually be these people may actually be more, you know have a more accurate grasp of reality than the Maharaja over there in his fabulous palace who's insulated from real life. The bowl of water that you offer to Krishna, if you offer it in the right spirit, with the right aim, in the, in the right frame of mind, with the right um, amount of humility, that little tiny, seemingly meaningless act may have more meaning and have more use to you 
than a massive, rich sacrifice. It's kind of the same story as the um, Jesus talking to the, you know, talking about the widow who uh, gave just a little bit of money to the temple, saying that look, what she gave is more than what all the rich men ever gave. Um, and it's a good cautionary tale. It's a good cautionary tale simply because in the Christian sense of things, or I guess in the sense in the Gita, God knows what is in your heart and how pure what, you, what you're doing is. Um, in sort of the non-theistic version, we do not know why someone else is doing something, and we don't know what effect it has on them, and we don't know what ultimately their view of reality is, because that that's something that has to be experienced, and experience is something that is utterly individual and private we don't know. And the amount that we don't know is not measurable either. We don't even we don't even know the amount that we don't know to compare it with the amount that we do know. Um, so this is kind of the the sort of corrective to the arrogance that I alluded to yesterday in my previous video. Um, and again there's several ways you can sort of come at that. You can say it's a, it's a moral thing. Arro arrogance is immoral or elitism is immoral, or it's arrogance and elitism are sort of a um, potential large error. You think you're smarter than everybody else, but like the young sannyasi, you may actually be not as smart of them as, uh, as they are at all, and you have no way of knowing. In the tale, of course, he finds out that he is a lot less <laughs> smart than the old lady and uh, her husband, the, uh, the butcher. Um, but ultimately, I think that the way I see it is we don't have any way of judging somebody else's experiences and somebody else's level of intelligence or wisdom or anything like that. It's just it's it's an unknown and 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 an unknowable. Again, it's it's a, it's at the experiential level that I that I that I'm talking, um, and we're all alone with our own experiences.